dear students welcome to e paatshala i am dr r sharada professor in the department of chemistry avanashilingam institute for home science and higher education for women coimbatore tamil nadu i am here to present the glimpses on the concepts of senses sampling methods sampling frame advantages and limitations of sampling sampling and non sampling errors the purpose of research is basically to explore the relationship between various variables which may be related to human behavior materials actions etc for example one may try to find out the relationship between intelligence and performance and in such a case the researcher may define the research research problem as the effect of human intelligence and academic performance in deterioration of material the researcher may try to find out the influence of environmental factors on the extent of deterioration and therefore the research is trying to find out the relationship between two variables in summary the purpose of research is to establish the nature and extent of relationship between two variables in establishing such a relationship the sample used for the study becomes very vital and selection procedure adopted by the researcher in any research is also of paramount importance the results of the study can be generalized to the population effectively when the right type of sample is used in the research therefore enormous attention should be given to sample selection proceeding further we discuss one of the data collection methods called census a study of all items in the population is known as a census it can be assumed that in census when all items are covered no element of chance is left and the highest accuracy is obtained but in practice this may not be true even a minute bias in such an inquiry will get larger as the number of observation increases moreover there is no way of checking the element of bias or its extent except through a resurvey besides this consumes a great deal of time money and energy therefore when the population is large this method becomes difficult to adopt because of the resources involved at times this method is not feasible for ordinary researchers it is possible only for the government to get the complete enumeration carried out government adopts this in cases such as population census conducted once in a 10 years further every time it is not possible to study every item in the population and sometimes it is possible to obtain sufficiently accurate results by studying only a part of the total population in such cases there is no utility of census surveys A census can provide detailed information on all or most elements in the population thereby enabling totals for rare population group or small geographic areas a census and a sample survey have many features in common such as the use of a questionnaire to collect information the need to process and edit the data and the susceptibility to various sources of error the census method can be applied in a situation where the separate data for every unit in the population is to be collected such that the separate actions for each are taken for example the preparation of the voters list for election purposes income tax assessment recruitment of personnel etc are some of the areas where the census method is adopted This method can be used where the population is comprised of heterogeneous items 
that is different characteristics. Now let's take a look at the advantages of the census method. The researcher can have an in-depth study about a problem and also can gather a lot of information about the entire population. There are more chances of the census data to be highly accurate when compared to the other methods of data collection. The smaller the population, higher is the degree of accuracy. Census method is the only data collection method that can be adopted for a population which is heterogeneous in nature. There are few disadvantages too in census method which are it is a highly inconvenient method because it involves a lot of manual effort. Besides being inconvenient, census method demands spending a lot of time and money to get the data collected. Census method cannot be suitable for all kinds of study. Its adaptability is very limited that is only to a few circumstances where the population is limited and does not require vast area of study. Thus, census proves to be a familiar method of data collection. Now let us go ahead with the next concept sampling. As mentioned earlier, selecting a sample for the study is the most crucial step in research. Sampling refers to the process of selecting few representatives from the whole group of items in any field of inquiry. The whole group is referred to as population or universe. Hence, sampling refers to choosing few items of the population which would serve as representative group that can be used to estimate or predict unknown information about the population. Sampling seems to be prerequisite when population is a bigger one and when there is practical difficulty in studying the entire population which is going to be time, cost and energy consuming. For example, suppose you want to estimate the average age of the students in your class there are two ways of doing this. The first method is to contact all students in the class, find out their ages and add them up, then divide this by the number of students that is the procedure for calculating an average. The second method is to select few students from the class, ask them their ages, add them up and then divide by the number of students you have asked. From this, you can make an estimate of the average age of the class. Yes, we are now aware of the sampling as a process. There are two important principles on which the sampling theory works. Principle of statistical regularity, which states that large number of items selected from a population is likely to be highly representative of the entire population. That is, a large sample tends to possess all the attributes of the population. Also, if the samples are selected at random, the samples will be a true representative of the universe which will produce better results. This is derived from the theory of probability in mathematics. According to this principle, when a large number of items are selected at random from the universe, then it is likely to possess the same characteristics as that of the entire population. This principle claims that the sample selection is random, that is every item has an equal and likely chance of being selected. Thus, this principle is characterized by the large sample size and random selection of a representative sample. Principle of inertia of large numbers states that the larger the size of the sample, the more accurate the conclusion is likely to be. This principle is based on the notion that large numbers are more stable in their characteristics than small numbers 
and the variation in the aggregate of large numbers is insignificant. It does not mean that there is no variation in the large numbers. There is, but is less than in smaller numbers. Well, when it is evident from what we have discussed that sampling is more crucial and is the key activity, the method of choosing, the method chosen to select a sample should also be highly suitable to find the best representative sample to obtain the desired results. Sampling method are broadly classified into two, probability sampling method and non-probability sampling method. A sample is considered to be a true representative of the population. The data gathered from the sample is expected to be applicable to the entire population, but many times such generalization are questioned citing flaws in the sampling method. For example, the researcher wants to select 200 girls from a group of 2000 for a research on the nutritional value of a product developed or to evaluate the usage of cloth in particular material say cotton or synthetic etc. And in this case, the sample is 10% of the population. What is the guarantee that the 200% uh, percent selected as the sample truly represent the characteristics of the 2000 persons? This may be possible if the sampling method applies ensures that every person of the population has a high probability of getting selected as one among the 200 persons. Such samples are called probability samples, indicating that every person of the population has a chance of getting selected. The results obtained from the probability samples are mostly objective in nature and the generalizing ability factor is fairly high. There are also possibilities that 200 girls sometimes represent a particular subject area or in cases volunteers too and therefore they will not be the true representative of the population. Such samples are called non-probability samples. The results emerging from non-probability samples are sometimes subjective and cannot be generalized to the population. Probability sampling is further classified as simple random, systematic, stratified random, multi-stage and cluster sampling. The types of non-probability samplings are convenience, judgmental, quota, snowball and accidental sampling. When we consider the advantages of sampling, the most evident and advantages are Every unit in the population has a chance of getting selected as far as probability sampling is concerned. As the sampling is mostly the true representative of the population, the probability of generalizability of the results too is very high. Direct and reliable data can be acquired as each and every unit is being dealt with. Accuracy of the data is high. Sampling involves less cost and is convenient. Organizational problems are very low when the population sample is taken for study. Facilitates better rapport between the researcher and the respondent. Intensive and exhaustive data can be collected. Of course, there are a few few limitations with sampling to be explained. Less suitable for homogeneous groups as the generalizability factor gets affected. Example, a researcher wants to study the attitude of students towards curriculum and in case the population of students belonging to a school which admits only meritorious students then the population becomes largely homogeneous and in such case generalizability of the responses obtained from them to the entire student population may be low. Requires a lot of controls in sample selection which cost time and resources. Also, 
assuring a truly representative sample is difficult. There are chances of bias. Sampling is difficult in case the population is too small or too heterogeneous. Now, let us understand what a sampling frame is. Sampling frame is nothing but the unit of a population from which the sample is selected for the study. The definition of the population also determines the sample frame. For example, a researcher wants to study the papers published by the home science teachers of a university. Then all the home science teachers together become the population for the study and every teacher becomes the sampling frame. Simply stated, every individual unit of the defined population is a sampling frame. If the chief educational officer wants to gather information on availability of laboratories in secondary school in a district, then every secondary school in that location becomes the sampling frame and the total list of the secondary schools becomes the population. Sampling unit does not mean human beings alone used in census, but any entity that is used as a sample for the research. A good sampling frame will include all the individuals that belong to the target population exclude all the individuals that do not comprise the target population, include all accurate information about each unit of the population, list all the units in an order and organizes with a numerical identifier, avoids repetition of units and thereby the possible errors. As far as the application of sampling frame is concerned, there are a few practical difficulties. Missing elements, that is, some members of the population are included in the frame. Foreign elements, that is, non members of the population are included in the frame. Duplicate entries, that is, a member of the population is surveyed more than once. Groups or clusters, that is, the frame lists clusters instead of individuals. Yes, we are done with the sampling frame. We now proceed to what are sampling and non-sampling errors. In your research, the error may result because of the flaw in selection of the right sample. Yes, the sample is the true representation of the population. The results are bound to be suspect and therefore, such errors emerging out of the results are certainly sampling errors. The researcher should definitely minimize the sampling errors in research and therefore, probability sample procedure is advisable. The research may result in non-sampling errors too, which emerge due to the faulty methodology. In research, use of measurement tools, framing of the right hypothesis, use of the right statistical application, interpretation of data, etc also determines the quality and outcomes of the research and any error in these areas may also make the research outcome suspect. I shall now enumerate the types of errors. Errors due to the measurement tools. In research, the researcher develops a tool to collect data or else an existing tool may also be used. When researcher develops the tool, whether it is a questionnaire or a rating scale or an inventory and so on, the reliability and validity should also be established in order to gather accurate data. Reliability ensures the stability of the tool, whereas the validity indicates its true worthiness. Sometimes, the test may be reliable but need not be valid. And therefore, the researcher has to use appropriate methods to ensure a high reliability and validity of the tools to collect data.
This can be explained through a simple example. Suppose one wants to buy 5 meters of cloth and the shopkeeper measures 5 times in front of the customer using a measurement scale which considered 1 meter by the customer on its face value. As the process of measuring is repeated 5 times using that scale, the customer assumes that it is 5 meter. In this exercise, the procedure of measurement is reliable because of the consistency in the repetition of the task by 5 times. However, the customer later finds that the actual length is only 4.9 meters and on further verification finds out that the actual length of the measurement tool is only 98 centimeters. This indicates that the tool is not a valid one as it does not contain the real measurement of the meter. Therefore, good sampling technique but a poor tool may not bring out an objective outcome of the research thus resulting in a non-sampling error. The next type of error is errors due to the application of wrong research design. The research designs may be classified as descriptive studies, casual comparative, correlational and experimental research. Though the sampling is good, the researcher may not use the right design for the research which may bring faulty outcomes too. Applying experimental design when there are no proper controls, trying to establish cause and effect relationship between the variables through a casual comparative study etc. may contribute to sampling errors. The next is errors due to wrong selection of variables. Researchers sometimes commit mistakes in determining the variables of the research study. In order to know where the researchers can err, the researcher should understand the different variables like independent, dependent, antecedent and extraneous variables. In order to get the real impact of the independent variables on the criterion of the study, it is preferable to control the effect of the extraneous variables. Of such control may also result in non-sampling error of the study. Now, let's discuss the errors due to application of inappropriate statistical procedures. Some research studies may use statistical applications, but usage of the inappropriate technique may also result in errors in the study though the sampling procedure is correct. Parametric statistical procedures make the following assumptions. The distributions compared are uh, normal. The variances of distributions are equal and the subjects of the distributions are independent of each other. Non-parametric statistical procedures are used when the distributions do not satisfy any predetermined assumptions. The last type of error is errors due to inappropriate hypothesis. Hypothesis in a study is nothing but an educated guess. A null hypothesis is non-directional and usually used in exploration studies. A researcher may use directional hypothesis when there is better control over variables. Non-directional hypothesis work better in the case of confirmatory studies. Hypothesis testing involves application of statistics too. Sometimes the researcher may reject the null hypothesis when it is stainable and this error is called type 1 error. Type 2 error occurs when the researcher retimes the null hypothesis when it is false. A good research study tries to control the type 2 error. Though the researcher may adopt the right sampling procedure, the error may result through the wrong application of hypothesis too. We have reached the end of the session. Well, 
we have discussed the concepts of senses, sampling methods, sampling frame, sampling advantages and limitations of sampling, probable and non-probable sampling and sampling errors in this lesson. We have also enumerated the advantages and limitations of each sampling technique. We have described the errors that may occur in research due to other factors such as research design, tools for the study, analysis techniques etc. and how care must be taken in the selection of the sample considering these factors. Sample selection is not an independent process in research but an interdependent aspect to make the research study more effective. However, among all procedures used in research, selection of sample is a very important feature and we should try to reduce the sampling error to make the research more accurate. The time and energy spent on research will go on waste if the results of the study do not have an impact on the population and therefore utmost care is necessary in sample selection. Review of related literature on sampling procedure will also help us to make the sampling technique appropriate in your research. I also urge you to go through the research studies conducted in home science and other disciplines and see how the researchers have selected samples. The knowledge gained through this lesson will definitely give you insights in reviewing the sampling technique adopted by other researchers for various research design. Hope you got the concepts right. I wish you all the best.